Sí. Okay, uh, so let's start. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, for being here in this seminar series of complex systems. Uh, today we have the honor uh, to have among us uh, Ralph uh, Mexler. I'm going to say a few things about uh, Ralph, even, even though everybody knows him. Uh, Ralph uh, is a physicist that focuses on non-equilibrium statistical physics and anomalous stoch stochastic processes with applications to biology and soft material systems. He's currently a chair professor for theoretical physics at the University of Potsdam and is an Alexander von Humboldt Polish Honorary Research Fellow. He holds a diploma, a degree in physics, a magna cum laude, and a PhD in physics magna, summa cum laude from the University of Ulm. He did his postdoctoral research uh, position at Tel Aviv University with uh, Joseph Klafter, uh, uh, and then he went to MIT with uh, Meran Kardar. He became an assistant professor at, the, at Nordita, Nordic Institute of for Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen in 2002. Then he spent some time in Canada, where he was appointed Canada Research Chair in Biological Physics and at the University of Ottawa. And he moved then uh, afterwards to the Technical University of Munich as a professor. And since 2011, he's a professor for theoretical physics at the University of Potsdam. He has many awards. Uh, he, has, he, he, he got the Fedor Linen Fellow from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. He has the Amos de Schalit Fellow from Minerva Foundation. He has the, he's the uh, Emmy Noether Fellow from the Deutsche, something I cannot pronounce, I, I apologize, Ralph. And he has, uh, he, he, he's also, a, he holds a Canada Research Chair in Biological Physics, etc., etc. So, Ralph, thank you very much for being, uh, for being today with us. Uh, Ralph is going to talk uh, to us about non gaussian statistics in soft and biomatter. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. This, this was too long an introduction. Now I know why I have all the gray hair, or white by now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Um, it's probably one of the positive things that came out of the whole mess we're in currently, uh, that we div uh, uh, discovered all the Zoom stuff so we can be at different places. Also, of course, I would love to be right there with you and discussing all the stuff afterwards. Um, Isaac, could I ask someone to actually be present live so that I can see someone? Because it's yeah, I, I will be live. Is that okay? That would be great. Yes, that's great. I just need to see someone moving on the screen that makes it much better. Okay, so uh, uh, what I want to tell you today is not a finished story. It's actually ongoing work, but um, I find it quite interesting. So I, I wrapped it up into this talk. And um, whenever you have questions, it's not you know, overly polished. So please just interrupt and ask me questions uh, on the way. Um, by the way, the painting you see in the background, that's a Turner of Venice, and in a week from now, I expect to be exactly there. And I'm looking so much forward to some reality in life. Um, let me start with a small introduction into the fusion and the history of it. And uh, I think an apt person to start with is Robert Brown. You can see him uh, in the shine of his youth um, when he was in Edinburgh, Brown was actually a botanist. He discovered the uh, nucleus of, uh, I think, plant cells. And um, he got hold of some specimens of um, pollen, and these pollen were exceptionally big. And when he put them in water, they burst, and there were small granules coming out. And these granules he called molecules. And they were roughly a micron in size, a bit more than a micron. And he could just so see them in his shabby light microscope that people had in those days. And um, he was surprised because these thingies were fuzzing around. So these molecules were like living beings. And as a botanist, the first thing he wanted to do is test whether they might be alive or whether it's more a physical effect. So what he did, he took all kinds of substances, he crushed them down uh, and uh, in, into very small pieces. And lo and behold, they were actually fuzzing around the same way as the first molecules. So having this kind of physics approach, he discovered Brownian motion. He describes it beautifully in this old paper. You will find it on the internet. If you have half an hour, 
load it down, read it, it's real fun. And it doesn't have a single table, it doesn't have a single figure, very different from our modern papers. Um, and then there's some break. There were a few experiments uh, of, of diffusion, but the real breakthrough actually came uh, with the theorists. Uh, there's Albert Einstein, uh, who everyone knows. Uh, I have a lot of friends in Poland, so I always have to mention uh, Marian Smolochowski, who um, studied diffusion actually to a bigger, bigger extent than, than Einstein. He continued working on it uh, and published several papers. Um, and then there's a third guy who's largely unknown, William Sutherland, who published in the same year as Einstein, almost the same results. Uh, problem was he was somewhere down uh, under in uh, Melbourne and he published only in Melbourne and it went almost unnoticed. So nowadays we come back to this uh, famous relation. It used to be Einstein relation, then we got more correct. We called it einstein smolokovsky relation. And now some people call it einstein smolokovsky sutherland relation. So I'll, I'll be briefer at the end. You also see this flashy person here on the very left. This is Paul Langevin, who then uh, came up with the idea of stochastic forces uh, and uh, wrote then a stochastic uh, dynamic equation for diffusion. Einstein himself, he um, came up with three postulates, uh, how he defines uh, Brownian motion in his, um, uh, in his own language. Uh, but before I uh, mention this, let me quote from a, a, a book by French uh, mathematician Paul Lévy that was published in 1965 and to my best knowledge never got translated into English. Beautiful book. Um, and he mentions there, and that's something rare for a mathematician, he cares about reality. So he was one of the first real applied mathematicians. And what he writes is that the stochastic process that we will call linear Brownian motion is a schematization that well represents the properties of real Brownian motion, observable on a sufficiently small, but not infinitely small scale, and which assumes that the same properties exist across the scale. So he realized, and of, of course experiments uh, and, and also the theoretical work showed that you can't uh, uh, use the laws of Brownian motion on, on extremely small scales, because there you have a uh, uh, ballistic motion, it's dominated by mass and so on. Um, but with this, with this uh, uh, caveat, then Einstein used three um, definitions or three postulates for Brownian motion. First, you have a finite correlation time beyond which the displacements become independent. The displacements are identically distributed and the displacements have a finite second moment. And as soon as all these are fulfilled, uh, you actually get the two main uh, characteristics of uh, uh, Brownian motion. One is the mean square displacement that goes linear in time, you all know this, small d is the dimension of space, and uh, of course the, um, uh, the, 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 the outstanding uh, behavior is that the probability density function is a Gaussian. As soon as you violate some of these conditions, you might get anomalous diffusion behavior where the mean square displacement now is a power law of time, or you might actually get non-Gaussian probability densities. But once Brownian motion, once these postulates are fulfilled, uh, you have these early uh, experiments. We have uh, Jean Perrin here in 1908, who used exactly the idea that you have independent uh, segments. So when he measured his uh, trajectories in the light microscope, all these straight lines correspond to 30 seconds. And then these trajectories were very short to uh, uh, have any meaningful statistical analysis. He shifted all these 30 second intervals to a common origin and then fitted the Gaussian probability density. So he really used this independence. Um, another feature was used by Ivan Nordlund at the University of Uppsala. He invented a, a, a way to create very long time series. You see one example here, that's a mercury droplet uh, sedimenting in water. So you have the, the sedimentation, the deterministic part, and superimpose this uh, Brownian motion here. And as every step is identically distributed, he actually performed a time average of the motion. 
Uh, the third experiment I, I want to briefly introduce is by Eugen Kapler. This is my local hero because uh, he was born one town away from the little village I'm from in the Black Forest. Uh, no one knows him there anymore, but um, he actually at that time made the best diffusion experiments ever. I mean, we are the area where the cuckoo clocks come from, right? So we know a bit about mechanics. And um, he had a different experiment for Brownian motion. He used a small mirror suspended on a long thread. So the mirror performs uh, Brownian motion through bombardment by air molecules, but you have the restoring force by the, by the thread. And when the angle is not uh, too large, you can have a, 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 um, a harmonic assumption for, for, for this motion. So he actually measures an einstein uhlenbeck process, diffusion in a harmonic potential. And uh, he managed to measure the stationary distribution, the Gaussian, and here you can see his result for a Gaussian, which I find, you know, marvelous. I mean, this is three years of work uh, in, in his PhD thesis. And the reason that I show you this Gaussian is because on the next slide, uh, after this one, sorry, uh, you will actually see them non-Gaussianity. So after these, these experiments that are, some of them are more than 100 years old, um, I want to flash over to uh, what is possible nowadays. So this is, this is an example from Yuval Garini's lab at Barilan University. And what you can see is this big blue cloud. This is just fantasy. This is roughly the, uh, um, the, the extension of a nucleus in, in, in a living cell. But what's measured are these small zigzag lines that you see all over. So these are the end parts of chromosomes in these cells. And you can measure several of them simultaneously. So experimentally, there is a resolution of a few nanometers at sub-millisecond level. So you can actually see uh, this motion live, uh, and it creates terabytes of data that you actually have to process afterwards. Another example I want to show you, these are supercomputing studies, and the image is, 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 is from Matti Javanainen, uh, a PhD student I worked with in uh, Finland. And modern uh, simulations, they can simulate kind of membranes, model membranes, where you have all these small lipid molecules, and then you have embedded in these uh, a whole array of uh, large chunky proteins. And of course, you can get all kinds of insight from these um, experiments and um, supercomputing studies. And some of them, they include new physics because uh, you see anomalous diffusion. We will see there's heterogeneities and whatnot. Uh, and typically, one measures time averages. So we have to worry about uh, ergodicity because most of our uh, theories, they're based on um, ensemble methods. So uh, if we want to fit data or describe data with these, the, the system better be uh, ergodic. And then there's aging and whatever, and the disorder uh, that we'll come back to again. And once you have these individual uh, time series and you evaluate them, you also have access to all kinds of fluctuations that contain uh, a lot of information. Uh, and um, there could be fluctuations in the parameters, locally, temporally, that I will show you. Uh, and we have all kinds of observables that uh, show um, fluctuations and the kind of fluctuations and how they uh, develop as a function of time, uh, as a function of measurement time and um, um, I lost it. I lost what I wanted to say. Okay, anyway, you, you see a lot of uh, uh, fluctuations there that you can use and evaluate uh, to interpret your system. And recently I, I thought back to the time when I was a PhD student and I always saw these images, some of you will remember them from uh, these people who were talking about dynamics and glassy systems. And they always had these images where the response function they measured in the whole system was very complex. Uh, could be, I don't know, uh, um, spectroscopic, uh, dynamic spectroscopy, whatever. 
Uh, and uh, the question was always, is it because the system is very heterogeneous, so locally the response is very sharp, but when you superimpose all of them, it gives you the complex signal? Or are even the individual units very complex and naturally you would get this response? And now we're there, now we can actually probe locally, microscopically, that's actually very exciting uh, and there's loads of open questions. Now, um, let me come to this uh, first big topic I want to uh, dwell on a little, and this was called Brownian yet non-Gaussian uh, diffusion by a colleague um, who used to be at um, Urbana-Champaign and then moved to South Korea, Steve Granick, and uh, he popularized uh, these phenomena. Uh, and I show you two very innocent looking experiments. Here you have uh, colloidal particles moving on a nano rod. And when you look at the mean square displacement, it looks perfectly Brownian. You have a linear uh, slope of your uh, um, time dependence. Uh, but then they ask the question, what happens to the distribution of displacements? And what you see here, this is log versus lin, you see these straight lines. So these are exponential tails. And then they let the system develop at the lag time at which they measure the displacement is getting longer and longer. And at the very last measurement they take, it looks like a Gaussian again. So at shorter times, you have these perfect exponential tails and then there's a crossover uh, to Gaussian eventually. A second experiment they report is a tracer particle in an actin mesh, uh, in a gel if you want, and again the mean square displacement is linear, and in this experiment they never see the crossover, they only see the exponential tail. And these non-Gaussian uh, tails, they have been reported from a large number of systems, I only show you a few more uh, examples, but when you look up on the net this, this has really uh, um, become very, very widespread. Another example are these nematodes, tiny worms, uh, for which, again, they found uh, exponential tails in the distribution of displacements, and they also mapped out that they have an exponential uh, distribution of the diffusivities of these guys. A more physical example is from Yael Reuchmann's group at uh, Tel Aviv University, and she puts all kinds of immobile tracer particles in a liquid and then their small, uh, no sorry, these are obstacles, the obstacles are fixed and then there's small uh, tracer particles, you see these shiny particles here, and she follows them in this array of obstacles and then she increases the density and at the higher densities you see the development of these exponential tails. And she also gets uh, uh, non-Gaussian, not as pronounced, but also non-Gaussianity when she uh, leaves the density but increases the uh, dissolve. And things like that are also important in biological systems. I show you one example here from uh, the late Jörg Langowski's group in Heidelberg, where they mapped out with the same tracer uh, the local mobility in a biological cell. So you look at the cell from above and uh, you can see that there's very distinct uh, regions with different mobilities. So heterogeneity is very important uh, in these systems. Now the first very simple uh, description for this non-Gaussianity is actually going back to uh, uh, Steve Granick when they uh, saw these uh, non-Gaussian uh, distributions and it's um, a theory that's called super statistics, I, I, I think a beautiful word, uh, that was um, coined by Christian Beck and um, Eddie Cohen. Uh, and they assume that a single particle, for instance, uh, in your experiment, it follows a Gaussian uh, density for one given diffusivity. But now you could say, I have either different particles distributed on different patches with different mobilities, like in this cell, and when I uh, uh, measure all of them, I actually get a convolution of all these, uh, or a mixture of, of all these, these different Gaussians. So they take a Gaussian with one uh, uh, diffusivity, and then they just average over a distribution of diffusivity. It's even more natural when you think of uh, your experimentalist colleague buying uh, these little plastic beads 
uh, from a supplier, they actually come even with a, uh, a size distribution uh, that they measure and, and they can't uh, produce them perfectly identically. So you have a, diff a, a distribution of sizes, meaning a distribution of the facilities. And this gives you, of course, then a non-Gaussian distribution. When the diffusivity distribution is exponential, you get exactly the exponential distribution. You can make it more complicated, doesn't matter, some stretched exponentials, whatnot. Uh, um, Ralph, Ralph can, can I ask a question here? Sure. About this approach? Uh, I think I agree with you, which is kind of uh, interesting, but uh, it looks to me like a bit uh, artificial, right? In the sense that like if you have a prior distribution for the uh, diffusion coefficient, you can get any posterior distribution. Uh, you Absolutely. mentioned that, that now you can do very precise microscopic experiments. Would, would it be possible actually to measure the diffusion coefficients of different, of different Brownian particles and then get the distribution a priori of the diffusion coefficients from experiments? Um, in in, in some, some cases, definitely you can. Uh, I show you in a few slides an example from simulations. Okay. Um, so so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to your question. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I, Professor, I also have another question. All the sure. results that you have shown uh, so far are just only computer simulation or are acquired with a particular technique? Haha. So uh, these are actually real experiments uh, using holographic optical tweezers and uh, um, uh, fluorescence microscopy. Uh, these are also real experiments uh, on the whole slide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I forgot to say, I mean, uh, um, when, when you look at the uh, experiments I mentioned here, uh, this is all based on um, the, the idea that you have a fluor, fl fluorescent tag on, on a very small molecule and you can actually follow it uh, even in, in a biological cell. So the experiments have become beautiful in that sense. Okay, so uh, the disadvantage of the super statistics is that this uh, uh, diffusivity distribution is static. So you can never observe this crossover uh, to a Gaussian in this framework. I should also say it's closely uh, uh, related to uh, uh, a theory of gray Brownian motion that was developed by uh, our old friend Francesco Mainardi in Bologna. But now uh, uh, for uh, uh, Isaac, um, look at this very simple uh, system here. We have a protein here and um, it's just in water. So there's no uh, uh, complicated environment, uh, but the protein itself has the property that it's shape-shifting. So uh, um, it has, of course, a very complex landscape. And some proteins, they're very much arrested in, in their native state. This is one protein that still, you know, it can really breathe a lot. So as a function of time, you can see that it can have a very compact structure or it can open up and almost become, you know, a straight object. And the question is, while it becomes bigger, it has a bigger uh, hydrodynamic radius, does this affect the diffusion coefficient? And that was uh, uh, a very nice, um, simulation study, uh, uh, mainly done by Eiji Yamamoto and uh, Takuma Akimoto in uh, Tokyo. And we discussed this stuff for uh, two years, I think. And um, uh, we found the following um, statistic that came out of it. So the first thing is, how do you quantify the size of the object? And we just use the gyration radius. You all know this from uh, polymer physics. And then we can see here as a function of time how the gyration radius fluctuates. It's not a lot, but you, you can see uh, distinct changes becoming bigger, becoming smaller. And this uh, uh, black line, this is just averaging out uh, the fluctuations. Uh, at the bottom, you see the time local diffusion coefficient. So you look at the fluctuations locally and you calculate the strength of these fluctuations and then you extract this diffusivity and you can see almost a mirror image that where the uh, size of the uh, protein is big, the diffusivity uh, is becoming small. So you have this immediate correspondence of the size of the object and the diffusivity. And the uh, overall statistic is that 
the uh, time local diffusivity scales with a uh, momentary gyration radius like this. So we get essentially uh, uh, a Stokes law. It's just that the gyration radius is offset by this R naught, which we interpret as the hydration layer uh, on, on, on the surface of the protein. And this R naught is only 0 0.3 nanometers, so much, much smaller uh, than the typical sizes uh, that we have. Actually, not much, much smaller, but smaller than, uh, for instance, here, when we look at the same statistic for all kinds of different proteins, we get the same law up to almost 100 uh, nanometers in size of the protein. But so we have this time fluctuation uh, in the uh, diffusivity due to the shape of the object. We looked at this for different uh, pressure and temperature conditions. You see in this case where we have a, a high temperature uh, and a high pressure, you see it's almost a bistable system. It's the same system just under different physical conditions and you see these two uh, big clusters at room temperature or a bit higher than room temperature and small pressure, you see that it really explores almost the entire range. But still, what remains the same is this direct correspondence between um, local gyration radius and diffusivity. And the same thing for other proteins, I will not go into this uh, detail. So this is a time varying diffusion coefficient because of the shape-shifting of the object itself. And this is actually uh, also a big topic when you perform experiments in a cell, because cells are gooey, there's all kinds of stuff in there. So when you have a tracer particle moving in there, it accumulates dirt on the surface and also uh, changes its diffusive properties. Um, and also mention another effect uh, a bit later on. But once we are in a heterogeneous medium, and this is a, a, a cartoon by, uh, uh, from a paper of De uh, Denis Krebenko, uh, and he illustrates the, uh, a very similar effect in this disordered environment. Now, as a colorblind, I have to find the, here, here is your tracer bead, and I, I, I think it's green, so you might all see it. And uh, so this tracer bead is moving through this actin gel and eventually should reach a target. And while it moves, the actin gel is supposed to breathe. So locally, it can become a bit more open or more dense. So while the particle is moving through it, its environment is constantly changing. But locally, this will lead to uh, um, a time evolution of a fluctuation of the diffusivity or the mobility, if you want. So now we all are, are very close to one model, and I called it annealed. It means that before the particle can come back to the same spot, the environment has already changed. So this is why, in some sense, in, in an approximation, and we have to discuss how good this is, um, we assume that I can put all the changes of the environment into a time dependence. It's a model, it's an approximation, but, but I will show you where it leads. It's actually a cute model. It was originally introduced and called Diffusing Diffusivity, beautiful name, by my old uh, Ottawa colleague, uh, Gary Slater. And uh, having a collaborator, Alexei Chechkin, who many of you know, who's fond of perfect analytical uh, um, solutions, we found a minimal model uh, that we could solve. And so what, how would we, do we describe our particle? We have a Langevin equation. I wrote it in one dimension. We can do it in any dimension, doesn't matter. And the, the uh, uh, change in position is driven by a white Gaussian noise. But now I introduce this time dependent noise strength, the diffusion coefficient. I want it to be stationary. I want it um, to have a, fi a, a fixed correlation time. And this is why we mapped the diffusion coefficient onto a process y. We square y, so d is always positive, as it should. And y itself is described by an einstein ullenbeck process. Here we have the restoring force with a given time, uh, uh, um, characteristic time. And here we have, again, another white Gaussian noise. So while this, this particle is moving, its diffusivity is changing all the time. And uh, 
You can solve it uh, uh, explicitly in, in Laplace space, uh, and uh, then you can have analytical uh, results for the short and long time limits. At short times, this model gives you exactly the super statistical uh, description, these exponential tails. And then beyond this correlation time, you actually get uh, uh, back to a Gaussian distribution. Due to the formulation of these models, the funny thing is that your mean square displacement, as in the experiments, it's always the same linear dependence with the same coefficient. And the coefficient is given by the uh, equilibrium value, the thermal value uh, of this einstein uhlenbeck process. It comes out so nice and easy because as the initial condition for the diffusion coefficient, we use a thermal distribution. Okay, so in the ensemble limit, uh, it gives you um, exactly this behavior. You can see the kurtosis relaxes from a value for uh, uh, a Laplace distribution, an exponential distribution, to the value of a Gaussian. Okay, so this was kind of our first model. We generalized it. We also looked at non-equilibrium initial conditions uh, in this paper here. Uh, by now, there's a whole range of different um, approaches. And uh, one, I come back to what I said before, your particle can change as it moves through the environment. So many of these biological traces people use, they dimerize or they oligomerize, and then they become smaller again, they depolymerize. So of course, while they change the, the size, they, they change their mobility, and it leads again to uh, exponential distribution. Even, you know, within uh, uh, a range, uh, a two-state model, one very mobile, one uh, uh, much less mobile uh, phase, and the particle is changing uh, between them, gives you shapes that are very similar to what's seen in experiment. But an argument I really like most, maybe, of all of them is extreme value statistic. That's a paper uh, from last year by two old friends, Eli Barkay and Stas Burov, and they said the following. When we normally talk about a random walk and we want to get to a Gaussian distribution, we take the limit of many jumps, right? But now ask, when you have a finite number of jumps, what is the, the statistic of your tail? Of course, it's exponential because then it's uh, uh, dominated by extreme value statistics. It's a beautiful uh, uh, argument. There's also some, some work that hasn't been published yet by Jakub Schlenzak and Stas. Uh, where they use some compartmental, uh, compartmentalization model uh, with some uh, uh, partial uh, reflectivity. And we uh, also came up... Yes? Uh, can I ask, Ralph, uh, this is actually extremely interesting. I noticed that uh, uh, all these different models that, uh, that assume that the uh, diffusion is either changing, changes continuously over time, or maybe you have two states, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the day, they always give the same kind of universal law, which is exponential, okay? It is possible to have something, a, a different type of universal law, which is not exponential? Um, we observe it, and uh, with these kinds of, of, of functionals of Brownian motion, you can, for instance, get it, but I don't know a microscopic, a truly microscopic model yet. I see. Uh, with, with all these extreme value statistic models, you get to the uh, exponentials. Um, but uh, um, we do observe non-exponential non and non-Gaussian. I'll get to that. Um, and most likely a big part of it that, of course, is neglected in these models is the quenched nature of your environment. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, uh, actually, I come to it here already. Um, so what happens when you cannot neglect the quenched nature of your environment? So this is uh, uh, from some simulations by, by a Chinese group. Actually, I met uh, uh, the main author, I think two years ago uh, when we organized the conference in uh, Lanzhou. And he assumes that he has a patchy environment. And each of these patches with different colors, they mean one mobility for the particle. And now it's moving across this landscape, so it's changing between different diffusivities. Um, and uh, of course, this produces non-Gaussian shapes. And in their um, studies, they came to uh, these exponential tails. 
Uh, now they also have, in the newer paper, they slowly change the landscape and they analyze what's going on. Um, but it's mainly based on, on simulations. Um, the same for, for a paper by Alexei Chechkin and my old friend Igor Sokolov that was published last year. And there's actually a very similar older model by uh, the Levenstein group uh, in Barcelona um, that was assuming different patches and then uh, our particles move between patches and so on. But still there is no, you know, whole theory. How do I get from here to there without all kinds of assumptions and really see um, the, the, the effects of when the particle gets back to the same spot in space, it has the same mobility. The last example for, from, from biology I give you are these very strange um, uh, Dictyostelia amoeba cells that my colleague Karsten Beta is analyzing in Potsdam. And they all just fuzz around on a two-dimensional surface. The, I, the simple model is they go in a different direction, they lose sense of direction, eventually perform an active Brownian motion. And of course, we, we, we can be sure that no cell is identical to the other. I mean, they have different mobilities, they have different breakfast or whatever. So we would never assume that they're all identical. But here, again, what, what is surprising to me when we look at the uh, displacement distribution and we extend the lag time at which we take the displacement to longer and longer values, when we go to 600 seconds here, it more and more converges to an exponential. Uh, so it comes from some kind of stretch Gaussian to an exponential. And in, so I'm bugging my, my colleague to run more experiments so we can actually explore what's, what's going on in more detail because we can't really tell more uh, from the current data. Okay, so when you don't see more in experimental systems, you go to simulations. And uh, uh, I show you two, three uh, extremely innocent looking systems where we see a lot of features that I actually did not expect. Um, here, that, that's the first example. That's a collaboration with a group of Mike Finnis at Imperial uh, and Amanda, who's now uh, currently back in Spain. Uh, she worked on this on her, uh, in her PhD. And it's motivated by drug delivery. So the idea is you have two silica slabs. You can see them top and bottom. In the middle, you have water and you put a drug molecule with this name. And uh, then you just look at the uh, uh, translational and the longitudinal, transversal and longitudinal uh, uh, motion of the particle. And uh, what they see is actually, the closer the particle gets to the surface, the more it gets stuck. And the effective motion uh, transversally becomes actually very interesting. You see again, exponential tails. Also, the difference in, in the mobility are, are close to the um, silica surface and the center uh, is, is not that different. The only thing that comes into effect is that when it gets all the way to the wall, it gets stuck for some time. Uh, what I don't fully understand yet is that the velocity velocity correlate is not like a continuous time random walk, for instance, where you just have pausing and then you continue moving, that's not correlated. One step, you lose the correlations. In this process, there's also anti-correlation. There's this very typical uh, um, displacement correlation that we know from uh, things like fractional Brownian motion. And that's extremely interesting. We have combinations of this, we have aging in that motion. And of course, I forgot to say, we have crossovers in some anomalous diffusion uh, behavior. So it just shows you that, that, again, very simplistic systems, very simple systems can show uh, uh, this quite complex response. Of course, these are at time scales that are relevant mostly for uh, the simulations. We're talking about uh, tens of picoseconds uh, and anomalous diffusion to a few hundred of nanoseconds. Okay. Um, in biological systems or complex liquids, we see, just focus on, on, on this one here, we see very similar um, viscoelastic um, velocity velocity correlations where the uh, uh, correlator goes back to negative values. And that's 
very typical for these systems. You see the particle move one way and it's being pushed back by the environment and it has to go the other way. So it's typically a many body effect that when you uh, uh, integrate out all the other degrees of freedom, you get this for the effective single particle behavior. We see this inside cells, we see this in uh, worm-like micellar solutions, uh, and we had some, some early work on this, uh, especially together with my old friend Lene Ullers here from the Niels Bohr Institute. But we never looked at the displacement distribution. We were lazy. We had the data, but we never thought about the possibility of looking at it. And then, of course, you need people from, uh, uh, from Stanford to do the, the job for you. So this was a paper by Andy Speckowitz and Paul Wiggins a few years back. And they actually looked at this displacement distribution. And what do they find for both bacteria cells and uh, uh, beer yeast cells? They see pretty much these Laplace distributions. So it's some of the same cells we were looking at before, and they actually uncovered this beautiful exponential distribution of mobilities. Again, uh, uh, to your question before, why exponential is an extremely complex system. Uh, and apart from these, you know, pretty cheap and dirty arguments from before, I, I don't have a much better uh, explanation at the moment. We see similar effects. I will not go into this uh, uh, paper uh, for diffusion uh, of traces in mucus in, in, in the gooey stuff that we have in our nose and we're not. And they typically see in some of the pH conditions that some fraction of the particles are almost immobile, others are mobile. And when you add this up, you get non-Gaussianity. Um, I will not go into a lot of details here because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, but let me say one thing to these diffusing diffusivity models that I showed you before. When they're Brownian, when they're in the way I showed you this minimal model, Langevin equation coupled to this einstein uhlenbeck process, they're very robust. You can phrase the model in very different ways and the main behavior is roughly the same. So then we wanted to know when we have this viscoelastic behavior with this strange anti-correlations uh, uh, in the motion, how does the same model fare when you fuel it with this correlated noise that's typical for the viscoelastic diffusion? And here it turns out that uh, the response of the system is a model, of course. The response of the system is very different, very sensitive to the exact formulation of the model. Uh, we, we came up with a Prosecco model, of course, our uh, uh, Italian friends had this beautiful name. So that was the simplest generalization we had. But there's also other models that go back to some Indian colleagues or, or this switching model between two diffusivities. And depending on what exact formulation you have, you actually get very different behavior. For instance, in some models, the diffusion coefficient varies smoothly with the anomalous diffusion coefficient. In others, you have jump behaviors, discontinuities. So there's a lot to do still. We have to go from the Prosecco model eventually to a Grappa model where we have the truth of life or something. Sorry for the pun. Um, how, how, how much time am I left with, roughly? So I would say uh, 10 more minutes, actually, if you want. Oh, this is, this is great. That's, that's all I need. Uh, I, I hope to be brief. So the next simulation I want to show you is uh, uh, simulations of lipid bilayer systems. So these are the simplest model membranes and all the lipids are of the same kind. Or in the lipids, we can put these cholesterol molecules or we can quench temperature and go to the gel phase. But in all the three phases, the uh, behavior of the lipids is dominated again by this viscoelastic behavior. We have uh, an, a reproducible behavior, so there's no uh, big ergodic violation or whatnot. Each uh, trajectory uh, for every um, lipid has the same behavior. And we have some crossover features that we modeled uh, some time ago. But the question is, what if we introduce heterogeneity into this model? And this is what we uh, analyzed in uh, a paper a few years ago. Um, 
this was in this collaboration I had with the Finnish friends. This is the group of Ilpavattolainen who were running all these very long simulations. Here you see the membrane from the top. These small uh, dots, these are the lipid molecules that you see from top. And this uh, yellow big spot, this is a single protein embedded in this membrane. So this is the dilute solution uh, where we only have one of these um, proteins. And then when we look at the displacement distribution, it's perfectly Gaussian. The way we plot it here is that I take one minus the cumulative and then the logarithm. So this filters you out the power law behavior inside the exponential, and you can see perfect quadratic scale. But then we go to a crowded uh, uh, regime where now the lipids, they can be trapped in between these big chunky molecules or they can associate with the surface. And what we see is that the quadratic scaling is modified and we get these stretched Gaussians with these uh, uh, stretching uh, exponents somewhere in between 1.3 and 1.7. So this is still far from exponential, but it's of course also no longer Gaussian. Um, but apart from these diagnostic analyses, uh, there is not much more that we have at the moment. Good. Um, but we can extract a bit of the uh, physical uh, behavior. So what we have, this is uh, the extracted local diffusion coefficient for the motion of these uh, lipid molecules. And you can see here, in this example especially, there's a very clear intermittent behavior. High mobility, then they're kind of trapped uh, in between the chunky proteins, they escape again and they're trapped and so on. So we have a bimodality. And this, of course, in this statistical level, uh, can explain or can help us to explain the non-Gaussian. We try to understand the system a little bit more by using, forgetting all about the uh, uh, chemical uh, details of these molecules, we only use an argon gas, a hardcore uh, spherical gas here in these simulations, and then we put obstacles in there. So these dark ob uh, uh, objects here, these dark circles, it's a two in effectively a two-dimensional system. These dark circles, they're just immobilized uh, argon uh, particles. And now the mobile ones, they have to squeeze through these little uh, channels in between the molecules. And we actually see this intermittent behavior. We see non-Gaussian distributions. Uh, so at least for the membrane system, this effectively two-dimensional system, we are pretty sure that pure excluded volume may already explain a lot of this strange behavior. Good. In experiments, much longer time scales than ac are accessible uh, with the simulations, we actually also say exponential tails um, and anomalous diffusion in the tens of second range. So also in these real systems, um, these non-Gaussianity effects do become relevant. It's always nice to see an experiment. Um, that was the gong. Um, I have the last two slides. I'm very quick. Uh, I just flashed this up. If you're interested in things other than the mean square displacement, we look at single particle trajectory uh, power spectra and analyze them. So if, if, if you'd like to see more about them, uh, I refer you to the paper. And I should also say, I forgot, if you want the slides uh, after the talk, send me an email. I sent you a link and you can download uh, the PDF. Um, now, just for fun, the last slide I have um, is a little bit different, but still, of course, to do with distributions. And this was motivated by the study of uh, a colleague, uh, Schematos Janusonis at Santa Barbara. He's actually working in biology. He's dissecting brains. So here you see a dissected mouse brain. And he's interested in certain kinds of brain fibers and how they are distributed in the brains. And when they stain it and they analyze, you see that density of the fibers is much, much higher uh, along the uh, circumference where you have the hard walls. Um, for some reasons, uh, uh, we believe that, again, this viscoelastic diffusion, this fractional Brownian motion is a good model for this. Other people use it for 
are, are polymer dynamics as well. And you can see here a comparison of the artificial fibers we create from the process and the measured fibers. And now the funny thing is when you have some shape like this and you put normal diffusion on it and you just wait long enough, the density will be the same everywhere. When you go to a subdiffusive motion, where you have this anti-correlation as we had before, you see that there's something missing along the wall. There's actually a lower density. Uh, and when you go to super diffusion, the model that we uh, propose for these brain fibers, you see that there's an enrichment of the uh, probability along the dense, uh, uh, along the boundary. Uh, so. Just, just as a final word, because these processes all look very innocent, but once you try to understand them a little bit more, there's still a lot to do. And that's why people like Sid, Leo, uh, uh, all of you, we still have a lot to do and we're quite happy about this. You can read some more in some Physics Today articles. I have one, one two years ago with Diego. Um, and uh, so let me summarize. This non-Gaussianity is pretty much all over the place and uh, most likely in, in so many systems we never looked at it before uh, and it's still hidden uh, somewhere behind the data. We have a very simple model of fluctuation of diffusivities. It's relevant for some cases like when I showed you the shape-shifting uh, molecules or when your environment is uh, breathing quickly enough so that no correlations can build up. Um, and Eventually, we have to go to a quenched limit to understand what happens when we're really in a quenched disordered uh, environment. Uh, for the detection of non-Gaussianity, of course, there's different measures. We have the kurtosis that we had before. There's also one that Jakub uh, uh, came up with. It's the co-difference that is studied in the group in Wurzweb uh, extensively. Uh, and we also uh, look at how uh, large deviation statistics of the um, time average mean square displacement can be used to detect non-Gaussianity in the data. We're also currently working on um, kind of marrying physics and processes that are studied by applied mathematicians, especially also in the context of uh, financial data. They have these autoregressive processes and we try to map them uh, to uh, physical situations. And of course, I didn't mention uh, we have been working on um, data uh, uh, analysis extensively over the last years, especially with Bayesian uh, methods, but more recently also with machine learning. I just flashed this up. All the colleagues I had the pleasure with uh, uh, working with over the years, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Ralph, for, for this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, colleagues, if you have any questions, please, uh, there are two ways to uh, do it, actually three ways. One way, just uh, activate your microphone, uh, ask directly to Ralph. For students uh, from Mexico, that they, they, they prefer to maybe uh, ask in Spanish, maybe you can write it and I can, I can, uh, I'll, I'll try to translate. So Sid, I think you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I'm just curious, like near the end, you had problems that were related to like the pro issue of hydrodynamic dispersion, where you have like a flow field and you have a particle moving through the flow field and it's, it's experiencing different flow velocities. And it's, it's sort of a well-known problem, which has a Gaussian pr probability distribution in a long time limit. But I'm curious if there's some scenario you can imagine where that also has the same non-Gaussian behavior. I can only speculate here, but I, I would definitely expect this, uh, especially if you also have effects of, of surfaces somewhere, um, because mobilities uh, uh, become very distinct uh, uh, functions of, of um, uh, the distance from surface when you look at hydrodynamic interactions. Um, Actually, uh, uh, earlier today, I was looking at the uh, old paper by Richardson, uh, where you look at, at, these, at the dispersion in turbulence media. There, you, 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 you well know we have non-Gaussian uh, uh, tails. Um, so there's, there's, of course, non-Gaussianity with all kinds of different uh, origins. Um, 
this type I was talking about was, was mainly about heterogeneity. But of course, when you look at these hydrodynamic interactions and you really look at finite particles, you again get strong heterogeneity effects. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sid, and thank you, Ralph. Uh, Leo, I think you have a question. Please go ahead. Yes, I, I have a question, Ralph. In, in, in your very last uh, slide, I, I didn't get it why the, when you have, when you say that the particles go close, closer to the, I mean, the distribution of the particles go closer to the boundary, and with, when you don't have this, when you have this homogeneous distribution, why is it so different? I, I really cannot get it. Okay, of course I was too fast and I should have been uh, more careful. So what we're looking at here, of course, when, when you have normal diffusion, there's no correlations, whatever, it just equilibrates, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Boltzmann distribution in, in a hard wall setting is just flat. Um, now you have a process that, process that is long range correlate. Um, and you have a hard wall. So your particle comes, it's correlated, let's say it's positively correlated, like in this fractional Brownian motion when the Hurst exponent is larger than one half. So it bumps into the wall. You reflect it back and it keeps bumping. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the, the vision what, what happens there. And you do not have, so this is a process that do, does not have a fluctuation dissipation zero. Uh, uh, or, or doesn't fulfill uh, uh, a theorem. This is, you know, not unexpected in a biological system. Of course, the, the growth of these fibers is not dominated by a temperature rise. Um, but of course, it also, uh, uh, by, by using these kinds of models, uh, we face the, uh, uh, the fact that these correlated and highly non-Markovian uh, processes we don't have a framework of describing them in the presence of boundary conditions. We don't have an analytical way of deriving the first passage density for these guys. These are nasty. And uh, uh, it turns out that we even have not understood how they behave next to a reflecting boundary. It's quite fun. It's absolute fun. Okay. So, so I, I saw. So, so actually, if I can add something here, uh, coming from a different topic, actually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are uh, algorithms, uh, when you want to explore a, a polytope uniformly, there are algorithms designed to explore this, uh, this polytope uniformly. And uh, for instance, there's uh, all the boundary of a, of a polytope. These are called, for instance, they can run algorithms and things like this, okay? And it's kind of funny because if you are not careful with the way you implement the algorithm, you have the effect you, you find here, either you, explore too much the boundary, okay, or too little the boundary, and you don't explore the whole, uh, the whole talk. Yes. Of, uh, yes. I mean, funny enough, I mean, we, we just have, have one paper out in JFIS A, where we do not look at hard boundaries, but uh, our steep potentials. And there, I don't have any problem, you know, just using fractional Gaussian noise, and I, I see what, what, what the particle produces as a, a probability density. It's also, it's non, uh, um, non Boltzmann, so it's not, let, let's say you have a, an X to the fourth uh, potential, so you would expect this, this very steep Boltzmann distribution. Um, this you do not see when you have this fractional Brownian motion. You actually get, uh, for the super diffusive part, you get two humps. It's not a centered distribution, it has uh, uh, a shallow uh, um, middle, and then it goes up and has these two humps, and then you have the, the tails. And they look very similar to what you see in non-local processes in levy flights when you put them in steep potentials. Um, and uh, so there's some similarities between these. One is because you have these very long jumps, you just try to push out of your system. And the other one is a, a process that just is very persistent and likes to go in one direction. So there's, there's, there's quite some, some interesting stuff in there. I just wanted to highlight them. You know. yeah, yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. Any other uh, questions, colleagues? I think that we don't have questions in the chat. I don't think so. Yes, please, if you want to ask, please go ahead and mute your microphone and ask directly to Ralph. So, in the meantime, let, let me ask you one more thing, Ralph. I, 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 it seems to me that uh, maybe, maybe I, I didn't catch this thing correctly, that there is no simple model that 
captures this this effect where you you may have a regime where the deficient the, the uh, coefficient can, uh, can go from the anil regime to the quench regime there is no not a model that catches this well not at least for the systems uh, uh, I, I i've been discussing um i'm thinking i mean we we we, we do have quenched you know, we have models for, for quenched environments, like you, you have the quenched energy landscapes where you have traps. And uh, um, people, of course, know about this. And uh, when you have a, a finite uh, maximum trap, you eventually get the crossover uh, to normal diffusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so these, these, these are some specific systems where, where, where this has been explored. Uh, but once you put it uh, in, 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 let's say this, this slowly evolving landscape and whatnot we do not have any general approach that, that we can use yeah um, for I'm, political I'm, descriptions yeah i'm asking this thing because uh, in a spin glasses there is a way to uh, to extrapolate from a quincy disorder to an illness disorder. Okay? Yes. Yes. so you know so what you do is uh, you introduce a distribution for the in principle uh, frozen variables with a given temperature and then you make a very weird uh, replica limit, uh, which is related to the to the ratio of the two temperatures. So you can go yeah. completely from the quench regime to the to the anil, anil regime. I see. Okay. But I mean, for for just this example, I I, I showed you when you look at this this paper by Sokolov and uh, uh, Chechkin. So they they try to find at least some scaling arguments, you know, for the exponents they they observe and it is not that trivial. Okay, okay. Uh, very good. So if there are no uh, more questions, uh, I would like uh, all of you please unmute your microphones and uh, shall we uh, thank uh, Ralph because he's just applauding in the old-fashioned way. Thank you very much, Ralph. Pleasure. And, uh, and we hope, Ralph, that uh, when this pandemic passes by, you can visit us in uh, Mexico City. Okay, you, you are always welcome here. So that's it for today, guys. So next week, we'll have uh, Satya Majundar. I don't, know, I don't remember the title. And in two weeks' time, we'll finish this seminar series with uh, Nobel laureate uh, Tony Leggett. So I hope I, I'll see you here next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.